All right, we still have some people logging on, but for sake of time, we will get started. So thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Um, just wanted to let everyone know that if they do have any questions during the presentation, to please enter them at the bottom of your screen in the Q&A box. And tonight's lecture will be given by Dr. Seelan Parekh. Dr. Parekh is our foot and ankle surgeon here at Rothman Orthopedics, and he sees patients in our Ben Salem, Newtown, and Princeton locations. We'll take it from here, Dr. Parekh. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining tonight. I know people are, are busy, so I appreciate the time. Um, I'm one of the newest foot and ankle surgeons to join Rothman, and although I'm new to Rothman, I'm not new to uh, practicing medicine. I was down in North Carolina for 17 years and, uh, and, and just moved up here about four or five weeks ago, originally from New Jersey, and I trained in, in Philadelphia, so in many ways, I'm, I'm back home. So tonight, we're going to talk about 3D printing. Uh, it's a it's a very exciting novel aspect of orthopedics and especially foot and ankle. And we we'll talked to you about ways that it's saving limbs and changing care pathways in foot and ankle for a lot of different conditions. You have to see it from this. You take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and do whatever you want. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. So in many ways, what I'm going to show you today is like taking the, the blue pill or the red pill. Once I show you this stuff, it'll open your mind to the possibilities of technology and 3D printing. And for clinicians, it changes the way they see a lot of problems. Um, and so uh, a lot of this is going to be case-based because it'll illustrate what we can do in the operating room uh, for patients. But let's start off with what is 3D printing because a lot of people hear 3D printing, don't really know what it is. It's also called additive manufacturing. And basically it's where you're printing something, but you're adding layers and layers and layers upon layers to get to whatever structure you want. And typically what happens is you start off with a CT scan like you see to the left here. And then the company that makes these implants will plan and create a, a CAD drawing. Um, and then the surgeon will look at that drawing, look at the plan and finalize it. And then it gets printed. And what you're seeing in the right-hand side, this video is an actual printing of one of the implants. And it's occurring in layers where, as you see the thing swipe over, it's a layer of powder coming on and then it's sintered with the laser and then yet another layer gets put on. And so it's this additive manufacturing that allows us to build uh, these implants. And so you may wonder why do this? Why are we not doing standard manufacturing? Well, there are some amazing advantages of 3D printing that you cannot get with standard manufacturing techniques. Number one is the complexity. So if you look at this upper left-hand bubble, there's a small little uh, picture of a, a very complicated structure that you could never manufacture in, in standard ways. But with 3D printing, there are no limits to the, the shapes and sizes and how these things melt to one another. So the complexity is phenomenal that you can get with 3D printing. The cost of goods sold is much, much less with 3D printing when you look at it at, at a mass level, right? So it, it, early in the technology, just like all technologies, when things first come out, it's more expensive, but eventually it becomes less expensive than standard manufacturing. You can make this personalized, which means we can give solutions that are specific to a patient, specific to their anatomy, and then there's ease of use. And, and I say this because once you plan out the surgery ahead of time, you plan out the implants, there's usually cutting guides that go with the, the surgery. So it takes a very complicated case and really dumbs it down and makes it very simple to do in the operating room. And so when we look at orthopedics and specifically foot and ankle, the way 3D printing first came into the market was really through custom instruments, instruments that were made to specifically do a surgery for a patient, but using off the shelf standard manufacturing implants. So here's a patient who had a fusion of the back part of their ankle, had ankle arthritis and needed an ankle replacement. So we can create these white 3D printed models that are specific to the patient that allow us to implant the total ankle in a much more efficient manner in the operating room. And typically we can save about 20 to 25 minutes of operating room time 
we're doing these kind of cases with these 3D printed gu guides. And that's an advantage because the, the, the shorter the wound is open, the less likely there's an infection. The, less the more likely you can get the patients off the operating room table. So there's other complications from anesthesia, from, from lung issues that can happen. So the faster we can do the surgery, the more efficiently we can do it, the better off the patient is in the long run. Here's a patient who had a bunion, but a, a type of bunion where it's rotated as well. So this is a very complicated type of surgery that you're not only trying to correct the bunion and make it straighter, but you're also trying to derotate it. And so here's an example on the left-hand side of where we 3D printed, we planned it, a 3D printed cutting guide. And then in the middle is uh, the middle is the cutting guide. On the left-hand side is the implant that we created to go with the cutting guide. And then what we can do is take this complicated surgery. We just have pre-planned where we're going to pin the guides in the operating room. And you can just do the surgery in the operating room very quickly and efficiently, and then get a correction where that big toe is nice and straight. The bunion is corrected. The patient does well and has a minimal chance of a recurrence. Again, saves a lot of time in the operating room, makes the outcomes more reliable and more easy to do in the operating room. Here's another patient who had this inward pointing ankle with some arthritis. And we take this and we, again, do the same thing, get the CT scan, send it to the company, create the cutting guides, create this little uh, wedge that goes in the bone with the plate that's also 3D printed specific to this patient's anatomy, and we can get better alignment. And so it's getting that better alignment that allows this patient then to have less arthritis pain and also allows them to keep their native ankle for much longer and hopefully can avoid the need for an ankle replacement or delay the need for an ankle replacement later in their life. So the cutting guides was the first thing that came to us in the operating room and technologies that we used. But then we iterated to custom metal implants. And so the companies, and there's three that do this, took inspiration from nature to really create different features of the implants that could be integrated to allow for higher success rates for the patient. So one of the companies on the left-hand side took, the, uh, took inspiration from the honeybee and it has, has this honeycomb type of texture uh, and, and ingrowth into this implant. Another, the one in the middle, took inspiration from waves and the sinusoidal pattern of waves and integrated that into their implants. And then this one on the right took inspiration from the truss uh, systems that are used for building and used that into the implants. And so there's different, these different structures that are now created into these implants that can be customized in size and shape. So I'm gonna illustrate this through multiple cases because I think it shows you the power of what we can do. So here's a patient of mine a uh, long time ago, had an infection in the bone in the middle of the, of the foot, and that infection was eating away at the bone. The patient had multiple surgeries and the infection was still not cleared out. And this is in the middle of the foot. And so the patient was offered either an amputation where the, they, they'd lose the whole leg or going in and cleaning out this one more time and trying to put a graft in there to try to get this to heal. And then I offered them a 3D printed implant where we could really cut out all the infected bone and make sure to clear out the infection. So we had to do this in multiple stages. We went in, cut out the infected bone, put in this spacer so we could keep the gap where we needed it, filled with, full of cement and antibiotics. They did get intravenous antibiotics. We cleared out the infection. We planned for an implant, and this is that custom cage that we made for this patient. There's a big gap that we're trying to fill in the operating room of all that infected bone that I had taken out in the prior surgery. We fill this cage up with bone from the patient, from cadaver, and we mix it in a slurry with some protein that stimulates bone healing. And then we can put it back into the patient and we can recreate their anatomy and give them a structure to their foot that's stable that and allows them to keep their foot. So this person went on to keep their foot. This that patient was actually a surgeon, so he's back to taking care of his patients and has an active lifestyle. And so this patient avoided an amputation. Here's a patient of mine who, at the age of 12 years old, was playing with his dad's shotgun, shot himself in the big toe, and this was when he was 12, so he's still growing, the foot's still growing, but he took out a chunk of the, the big toe. So the rest of the foot's growing, but the big toe is no longer growing. And because that big toe is no longer growing, he starts having a lot of extra pain in the other toes because those grow, toes continue to grow. 
So same kind of idea. We went in, cleaned out all of this area that, that had not been growing, the bone had not been growing, what was filled with scar tissue. But I had to bring his length back. So in stage one, I put what's called an external fixator on his toe, and I lengthened the toe so that we could get the big toe back to where it should have been. And then we created a cage to fill the gap that, that I had created. And here's what this cage looks like. It's filled again with bone, with protein that stimulates healing. This is what the x-rays look like. And he has gone on to college. He plays baseball recreationally. <clears throat> and, and when you watch him walk, you'd never know that he had a problem where he lost a chunk of his, his big toe. Here's a patient who had an ankle fracture that got infected. <clears throat> and then after it got infected, the surgeons who were originally taking care of him brought him back to the operating room and tried to clean out the infection and fuse or lock up this ankle joint. Well, that got infected as well. So then he came to see me. And the first step is we've got to clear the infection. So we take out all the old plates and screws, take away any dip bone that looks dead or infected. We put that cement spacer in, and that's what this looks like. And we then start creating a cage that's 3D printed specific to his anatomy that we can use to recreate the bone that we've lost. <clears throat> and so at the time that I did this case, the the uh, one of the, the newer Star Wars came out. And when I was creating this implant, I, I said, you know, this looks like the Death Star. And so hence it's called a Death Star. Um, and so this is what this implant looks like. It's spherical. It allows us to put this rod up the center of the bone and into the leg, but but it fills the gap of the bone that was dead and infected with this cage that's 3D printed specific to fit that bone that's been lost. And this patient goes on to, to keep their leg and be able to continue to walk with a limp, but with a, a limb. And that's the important part. Here's a patient who came to see me, 32 years old. He's a smoker. Two years prior to seeing me, he had a fracture of his shin bone. He had an external fixator placed, and then he had a rod put inside the bone. And then the surgeon who did the surgery took out the part of the hardware. And then he was told, you know what, you're fine. You can go on. You know, there's nothing more I can do. So this is the side view of the patient's leg. And you, you can see it's a little bit flexed. You see where the bone was broken. And you wonder, well, you know, what's the deal? Well, when you take an x-ray from the front, you see that this foot is totally turned inward. This patient can't even get their foot flat on the ground, can't barely walk, certainly can't work, and this was a problem. So again, using 3D printing, we went in. First step was clean out all the bone that was not healed or that looked infected, straighten out the bone, put out this external fixator, create some length so that his affected leg is as long as the unaffected leg. I had my plastic surgery uh, colleagues put on a skin graft and a muscle flap onto this area so that we can bring good supply of blood into the area to get this to heal. <clears throat> and then in the second step, we went in and that void, which is you're seeing here, this big void of bone that I cut away in the first surgery, we now have to fill that. So we used the good leg as a template to create the cage for the bad leg. And here's what the cages look like. We fill, fill it with bone graft again, fill it with protein that stimulates healing. We can drop it into this space that was created. I put a rod to provide the fixation I need. And within four weeks of having the surgery, he's walking on the flat part of his foot again. The bone has gone on to heal. He's about five years out from the surgery, is back to gainful employment, back to living the quality of life that he wants. And again, we saved a limb. Here's a patient who had this implant put in for arthritis of the big toe. Within three months, this implant becomes extremely painful for her where we have to take it out. But when you take it out, you have the space that you have to fill, which can be problematic to fill with bone graft. So you can use 3D printing where you can create this cage, a wedge cage that you can put into the space. It's got a plate attached to it so we can lock everything up so it's nice and stable. And her bone can kind of grow into this implant and fuse this joint successfully. Here's a, uh, a soldier who was shot by friendly fire. The, the bullet went through the top of the foot, out the heel. And what you're seeing here, this white, this white dense part is cement that's in the, the foot that the, the surgeons of the army had put into his foot. He was about to be medically discharged and he had pus coming out of both sides of the wound where it was entering and where it was exiting he did not want to be medically discharged. So he came in to see me because the next step was to offer him an amputation. So we went in, cleaned everything out, 
new antibiotics in there, new spacer in there. We created a replica of the amount of bone that was lost from the bullet. And that's what you're seeing here. And then once we clear the infection, we go in, this is that cement spacer I took out. We clear it out. We prepare the bone for receiving the implant. There's three sizes of the implant that we create. We pick the one that fits in well, and we lock it in place with some screws. And this is what it looks like. He's back being enlisted in the army, is actively uh, being a soldier, and has saved his career, saved his leg. Here's a patient who had surgery done where the second toe, the, the head of the second toe was removed at the time of the surgery of the person who, for the person who did this, the surgeon who did this. The patient ends up having a bunion that's then created and has a lot of pain in his smaller toes because the second toe no longer has the knuckle that you need to bear the weight. So I offered him one of the traditional surgeries that we have, which is to fuse the big toe and remove the other knuckles. And he told me, Dr. Parekh, I don't want that. You need to do something to kind of bring me my knuckle back. So here we, we you'll see here these three pictures. We straightened out the big toe, but using 3D printing, I recreated his knuckle. I used the residual bone that he had to lock this, this 3D implant in place. And he's gone on to save his toe, has avoided the fusion, has, uh, is, is back to wearing a regular shoe. And it's not perfect, but he's much better than where he was. This is a procedure called Cartiva that is done for patients with arthritis of the big toe. It has about a 10% failure rate in seven years because what happens is you put this implant in the big toe, and I don't know if you guys can see my pointer, but you put it in the big toe, and the reason why it, it is believed to fail is that it sinks in the bone over time. And so using 3D printing, we're trying to prevent what's called a subsidence or the sinking from happening. So what you do is you go in, you create your hole like you normally would. We have these 3D printed implants that are nice and small that could fit in the base of the hole we created. But on the back side of the implant, you have areas where the bone can grow into and where the implant will sit on the top, it's nice and smooth. So again, something that's very hard to manufacture, but very easy to 3D print. And so we put this at the base of the hole, and then we put this Cartiva implant on top. And this is what it looks like. You can see this, this 3D printed implant that's sitting, and then the Cartiva ho helps hold the space between the two bones so that the arthritis is not painful. We are now looking uh, at my collection over the last five years of this procedure to see if we have really changed the amount of subsidence that has happened with this Cartiva implant. The verdict's still out. This is a patient who had surgery from another surgeon that got infected. The middle of the foot, the entire middle of the foot is infected. This is what this MRI is showing. So you've, you kind of hear a repetitive theme now. We go in, clean out all the dead bone, clean out all the, the infected bone. We put the antibiotic spacer in place. We, we, rem, uh, we clear out the infection. And once you do that, we've got the big void. So we go in, we, we prepare that, that area that's going to receive the 3D printed implant. And this is what this implant looks like in the operating room. It, again, is very complicated structure that you cannot standardly manufacture. We can kind of decide where we want the screws to go, what trajectory we want the screws to go, where we want bone to grow into the implant to stabilize it, where we want these bone staples to go, all of it individualized for the patient. In the operating room, you can see we, we can give this patient some motion. This is what it looks like when we left the operating room. He's got this weird shaped implant, but allows him to maintain motion where we want it and fuse him where we want it. And this is where it looks like he's had this for about two years, is doing well, and has gone on to save the foot. Here's a patient of ours that uh, I'd done a flat foot reconstruction on him. So at a flat foot, we put this metal wedge into place to try to help correct the alignment. The bone dies, um, and it's something that rarely happens, but can happen. So the bone died. Now that the bone is dead, the, the patient's only option traditionally is to go in and take all the dead bone out, take this metal implant out, and then you've got to figure out how to fill the, the void that you've created with bone, and then you fuse this joint up. Well, I was trying to avoid that. And again, using 3D printing, we can take out the implant, the old implant, and then fill the void with another implant that allows us to have motion at the joint so we can avoid a fusion, but recreate her normal anatomy that we've lost through the prior surgery. 
And this has gone on to do well for her as well. Again, something you can't recreate with regular uh, manufacturing. And this is now where it gets really exciting. Um, if you weren't excited already, and from a from a physician's perspective, this this all is very exciting because we're able to do some really creative things. Here's a patient who came to see me, 19 years old, had leukemia when she was younger. Because of the leukemia, she was treated with steroids. That led to avascular necrosis of what's called the talus, the bone in the center of her ankle. Avascular necrosis means that the blood supply to that bone has died. And because it's died, now the bone is dying. And as the bone dies, it will crumble over time and cause her significant disability as life goes on. So an MRI just shows the amount of bone that's dead. This kind of irregularity, white part is the bone that's dead. Um, and there's different views of her ankle on, on the MRI. But this talus bone is dead. Traditionally, what we would have done is we would fuse the joint above, the joint below with a rod. And that means she would lose all of her up and down motion, half of her inside outside motion. Usually at 40 to 60% of the time, it requires a second surgery. And so it's a really debilitating issue. This patient had this condition not only in one foot, but the second foot as well. So using 3D printing, we got a CT scan, created a, a CAD drawing, and then recreated her anatomy with a metal implant that's polished. And, and so we can replace the entire talus. The way we do it is we make an incision in the front of the ankle. We've got to go in and kind of chisel that bone out. I have these trials that I can pop in to fit, figure out which implant fits the best. We get three different sizes made. This is what it looks like. The metal implant is here. The trials are right here. And you can see the motion that you can get. So we replace the talus. We keep the motion. She keeps function, which is amazing. This works so well that six months later, she had the other side done. And you know you helped a patient when her dad called me that holiday crying, saying, Dr. Parekh, this is the first year of, of my daughter's life as a teenager that she feels good enough to be shopping for the holidays with her friends at the mall. And that's the power of 3D printing. This is what it looks like. Um, and it's pretty amazing. Here's a patient who's five months out from a total talus replacement, has avascular necrosis, is feeling so good that she's doing box jumps against my medical advice. You can barely tell which ankle of hers has the incision, um, but she's doing well. It's her left ankle that has the incision, has a total talus replacement. So as time goes on, we get more comfortable doing this. This is a patient who has avascular necrosis where the bone's dying with ankle arthritis. So we can actually give her an ankle replacement with a talus replacement. This is a patient that has ankle arthritis um, the talus is dying, so avascular necrosis, but also has arthritis underneath the talus. So here we can do a fusion underneath the total talus with an ankle replacement. Here's a patient who has a deformity where the foot is turned inwards with the avascular necrosis, with the ankle arthritis, with the arthritis of the subtalar joint, which is the joint beneath the talus. So again, we can stage this, stage one, cleaning out the talus, getting rid of it putting an external fixator on, getting the alignment where we want it, and stage two, putting in a total talus with a fusion underneath and a total ankle on the top. Here's a patient of mine that I had done a fusion surgery on, then required an ankle replacement. So I do the ankle replacement, does great, is lost the follow-up, and, and then comes back to me four years later. And usually when you, when you see a patient come back after a while, it usually means something is not doing well. So here, what has happened is this implant has sunk or subsided into the talus. That bone has died over time, has dissolved away. And back in, in before 3D printing, my only option would have been one of two, either take everything out and fuse the joint so the patient loses all the up and down motion or give the patient an amputation. But now with 3D printing, I can give them a brand new talus and save the ankle replacement and the patient can maintain their motion. Here's a patient of mine who was involved in this car accident. So this is her motor vehicle. A sad story, uh, stayed outside of where I was, gets in the car accident, both ankles are involved. The, le uh, the left ankle, the bone, had the talus had come out of her leg entirely. So it's called an open fracture or a compound fracture. That bone was missing. 
um, patients brought to the or trauma bay, the surgeons tell the patient's mom that, you know, we may have to amputate this leg. Mom's like, no, do whatever you can, but save the leg today. They put an external fixator on this patient. Mom gets on the internet, finds well, out what we're doing, um, finds the, the, it goes to the scene of the accident the next morning, finds the bone, brings it back to the surgeons, and the surgeons are like, it's too late. It's been out for too long. It's too dirty, too infected. We can't save this bone. So again, she had found out what we were doing uh, um, and, and what I was doing in my practice with 3D printing, with limb salvage. So mom tells the surgeons, can we go see Dr. Parekh? So they come to see me. She's missing one bone, but what she's also missing is part of her second bone. This area is called the medial malleolus. If you touch the inside of your ankle, that bump there, that's the one that was missing. So using 3D printing, we are planning to recreate that bump on the inner part of your ankle. We're also planning to give her a talus that was lost in the, in the injury. Okay, so here's a talus and what it looks like. And now she's got this medial malleolus implant, first one of its type in the world with a total talus. She's a young, young woman who's able to keep her leg, able to date, able to dress up, able to wear heels, things that she potentially could not have done if she had lost this leg or ended up getting a fusion. So again, quality of life changing. Here's a patient uh, came to see me from a different state, had this massive injury where uh, the, the ankle was totally shattered. The bone was popped out of place and dislocated. Initially at, in the state that he was taken care of, this was done where you put pins and put everything back together as best you can. This ends up getting infected. The, the only option at this point traditionally is to do an amputation. Sent to me, we go in, find out where the infection is, clean it all out, clear the infection. We then create a, a talus, and this is what it looks like, but it has multiple surfaces for fusions. This is what we're doing in the operating room where the areas that are going to fuse, we put bone graft and we put this protein that stimulates healing with some hardware, and we can actually save this patient's limb where not only, this is one of the first ones I had done where we gave him a total talus, we fused underneath the talus, we fused in front of the talus, and we did an ankle replacement. Patients back to gainful employment has saved the limbs about four years out. And this is kind of the extreme case. Be, again, like I said, before we had 3D printing, for avascular necrosis, we would do what's called a, a, a fusion of, of three bones, two joints. And this is what this looks like. This big rod gets into place. It fuses up the ankle above, the subtalar joint below, and patients oftentimes need another surgery because it doesn't heal. She's seven years out from her surgery. This did not heal, but it's becoming problematic. Now I've had all this experience with 3D printing. So I said, okay, let's take out all the hardware where let's clean everything up where this rod used to be. Let's fill it up with bone so we can get new bone to form. And let's give you a ankle replacement with a talus, with a fusion underneath the talus. And we got her back motion that she had lost for seven years. Um, so it's an extreme case of where 3D printing can almost reverse old surgeries. This is not something we offer on a daily basis, but something we can do in, in the right case. So how are these patients doing? Their pain is not zero. It's usually one to two out of 10 pain. I have a firefighter who's back on the force, a patient who plays golf three times a week, 18 holes of golf. I have a patient who won the senior games for her state. I showed you my patient who's box jumping. So people are very, very active, although not impact, but active in a lifestyle. The real future, the real exciting part for me is when we no longer are 3D printing metal, but we can 3D print cells and organs. And I think through the course of my career, I'll be able to offer patients a cellular talus, right? And maybe we're no longer doing an ankle replacement with metal, but maybe we're replacing bone and cartilage again. And I'm hoping that in the next 10 years, we can do this. So 3D printing, we're at the tip of the iceberg. We're getting very good at 3D printing metal. We can change the, the course of diseases, whether it's the bone in the middle of the foot that's infected or dying, <clears throat> whether it's a total ankle that needs to be changed out or revised, whether it's from an ankle that's dying itself. We can customize things as we need with 3D printing. We can support bone growth in areas where we need it. This is structurally very strong. 
I've actually taken these implants and the ones we didn't use in the operating room, take them, taken, taken them into the parking lots and driven my SUV over it to see if we can make it bend or make it scratch and you can't. And so there's significant advantages of this technology. And again, we're just scratching the tip of the iceberg. Thanks and I'll open up to questions. Thanks, Dr. Parekh. Very interesting. Um, seeing if there's any questions. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to enter them into the Q&A box, the bottom of your screen or the chat box. Um, if you do raise your hand, I am I do have the avail availability to allow you um, to unmute yourself and to talk if you want to. Okay, I see somebody did. Hello, my name is Tamara Savage, and I know Dr. Preck very well. When he, at the end, he showed what clients are doing who came to see him, and I am the cyclist who not only won the senior games in my state, but went on to ride the national senior games eight months after my replacement in the mountains in Santa Fe, 20K and 40K. Not the fastest times I've ever done, but I've been off for 18 months with a, with a missed, um, uh, a vascular necrosis of the talus that was missed on MRR for three, three different times over 18 months. So by time I figured out myself um, through Googling what makes bone gray with other bone white, and I found Dr. Preck. And in November 2018, I came to him. Well, that's when I had surgery, but I, I, I came before that. I was there. I was there for six days. I went home in a short cast for six weeks. Uh, light. I was riding, uh, not shortly after that, against his advice, of course, but I was using one-legged with one with the boot, but was back to normal. I mean, and I don't have a grade one or two pain. I have rheumatoid arthritis, which is why I had all the steroids to start with. And I did not have, I do not have any pain. If there's any pain at all, it's arthritis above the talus, but I'm now four and a half years out. Um, I've ridden 60 miles in the last two days, and I'll do that again. I'm now 69 instead of the 65 I was when I first came to see him. And the reason I'm on this is because I followed him. I haven't gone back for the follow-ups because, because of COVID and all that stuff. And then I saw that he moved when I saw he was going to have this presentation. I was excited to see what he's up to because this technology... Uh, uh, what was the story we did? We did a little web thing that was from helpless to happy. That was a change in my life. It made me a person that could enjoy whatever years I have left and allowed me to do all the things that I want to do, um, except running. I don't run. But I just wanted to say thank you, and I will continue to follow you forever. You're the best. Thank you so much, Ms. Savage. Thanks for uh, for sharing your story. and and. Uh, you're fantastic. Uh, your story resonates, and it's not only your your story is so similar to what we're seeing with these tailless replacements. It's phenomenal to to be able to be uh, trusted by patients. Um, I know for you coming from the state you were, it, it took a while to get to me, but I'm glad you found me. I'm glad we worked together in, in the partnership. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Tamara. Dr. Prack, there are two questions in the Q&A box. I don't know if you can see them. Pull them up at the bottom of your screen. Yep. <clears throat> um, so the first one is, what is the percentage of getting the implant infected? So I tell patients that this is no different than our ankle replacements in terms of infection, nerve injury, blood vessel injury, and that's all less than 1%. So we sterilize the foot like we normally would before doing this implant or the surgery. So in and of itself, this implant's not any higher risk of getting infected than an ankle replacement from what we can tell. But remember, a lot of these uh, implants, or not a lot, but many of them are being done, especially the cages in a setting where there was a prior infection. And it's not the implant that's getting infected fresh. It's the fact that maybe we did not clear that infection out entirely. And the problem with an infection, I tell all my patients is it's like cancer. You never really know for sure you've got it fully beat. So although 
in the best medical technology that we have, we can say, hey, you're not infected. You don't know if there's one bacteria sitting in the bone somewhere waiting to get busy months, years, decades later. And so there have been patients of mine who we did do a cage and that cage got infected from the same bug that they originally had. And my feeling is that we just never cleared the infection, couldn't pick it up. Um, and then got it reinfected and then you lose those battles. So I don't want you leaving today's talk thinking that every cage is guaranteed to win. It's not, but it is a good shot at saving the limb to avoid an amputation. And ultimately, if we lose that war and lose that battle, we're back to an amputation, which was where it all began anyway. So it's worth trying to save the limb because I would tell you that probably more than 50% of the time, we're saving the limb. Um, the next question is, what is the material used in, in the 3D printing? So titanium is one metal that can be 3D printed as well as cobalt chromium. That's the second metal. Um, there, as, as 3D printing evolves, more metals will be 3D printed. Those metals are not all compatible with being inside a human body. So um, if you get online, you may think, you may hear that, oh, this metal can be 3D printed in that one. But if it's not inert in the human body, it cannot be used. But for human use, only cobalt chromium and titanium as it stands today. Um, next question is, will this procedure be available for other joints? I have AVN of a shoulder with a reverse total replacement, range of motion limited as a result. So this technology is, has now been adopted by many upper extremity surgeons, including shoulder and elbow surgeons. Um, you have to seek out those who are doing it. It's not readily available. It, it's in pockets around the country. Um, but you can find surgeons, I'm sure here at Rothman, we've got some of the guys here using so integrating some 3D printing into the technology. Uh, oncology surgeons and orthopedics, orthopedic oncologists are using it. The total hip and knee replacement guys are also starting to use it. So you're starting to see this technology percolate its way through orthopedics because it's such a game changer. Any other questions, either live or written? No. Yeah, we just had one pop up. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Great. Is the difference in outcome between total tailor replacement and arthritis versus AVN? I think the question is whether there's a difference in the total tailor replacement if it's done for arthritis versus AVN. So um, total tailor replacement is done because you have AVN. That AVN can happen either from an ankle replacement, from trauma, a talus that's been fractured that didn't heal. It can happen from steroid use. It can happen from alcoholism, hypercholesterolemia. Um, the biggest bucket is we don't know. So um, these patients can have total talus replacements for a lot of those things. When the talus is replaced and there's also arthritis of the ankle, what we have shown, and we've published on this now, is that those patients are doing well with a talus, with, with or without an ankle replacement, with or without a fusion. It just seems that as long as we're addressing all the pathology around the talus, we can make a difference in the quality of life of these patients. So, um, and, and if we're doing a talus alone versus a talus with an ankle replacement, with or without a fusion, we've not been able to tease out any differences yet. But as time goes on, each of those groups gets bigger in terms of the numbers we have, we should be able to tease that out. Um, in total, right now, I have over 100 patients in total that have a talus, a total talus in place. Um, so it's the biggest collection in the world, but again, not big enough for us to kind of compare these three buckets. So thanks for that question. We have a comment. Uh, thanks for the interesting session. Well, thank you for joining and we appreciate the comment. Um, the next question is, do you go directly from the MRI to a solid model drawing? 
So it's actually from a CT we go, not the MRI. And the reason why we do a CT is that a CT is much better than the MRI at looking at the surface of the bone. And the CT, we can control how many millimeters each cut is. And so we can get very, very fine cuts of the an anatomy in question so that they can go to the solid model more reliably. The thicker the cut, if I know what this looks like and this looks like, but I don't know what all of this looks like, I have to guess it. But if my slices are much thinner, it's easier to kind of more accurately guess the in-between. Um, and so the CT is the preferred way to do it versus an MRI. Thanks. Good questions. Any other questions? Um, we do have someone raising their hand, so I'll allow um, Richard to speak. Yeah. Okay. Here we go, Richard. I think you're muted. If you have a question, you can unmute yourself. Okay. Hello, doctor. <laughs> um, this is Rich's wife. Uh, he has some ankle issues. And I find this really interesting, the procedure. Uh, the bone stimulus product, is that RHBMP2 you're using in that cage? Yeah, in the cage, we're doing BMT, BMP2. That is correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because I know that's that's been around for a while. Yeah, it's been around for about 15 years. It's a phenomenal stimulus of bone. Um, so we use that and mix it into the graft. Well, a colleague of yours used it on me in 07. Okay, good. Did it work? And I could, I can touch my toes. Awesome. So I, I, I just wholeheartedly believe I had done a lot of research on that product before I had my procedure. And I found it just to be a fascinating, wonderful product to come down the road. Yeah, absolutely. It is, uh, it's, it's very, very powerful. Okay. Uh, and I assume within all the scope of the 3D printing, et cetera, uh, you've worked with people with birth deformities. Uh, I've only had one that I can remember with a birth deformity. The problem with birth deformity is it becomes a little more challenging because it's not just the one bone that's got the issue. A lot of times because the birth deformity as they've gotten older, there's a deformity of the tendons, the ligaments, mm -hmm. contractures, the surrounding bones. So it's much, much more complicated. Having said that, I, I have not had the opportunity to do it more than on one patient. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for the comment. Now, I think we have another hand up. Um, let's or, see. It's Tamara again. Um, I think she may still have hers up from last time. Oh, okay. yeah, she did that. Right. <clears throat> Any other questions? If not, um, I'm sure Dr. Parekh would be happy to answer any that come up. Um, you know, after we log off, you all have my email from the um, from registering for this this talk tonight. So, if you do have any further questions or would like to schedule an appointment with Dr. Parekh, please feel free to email me. Reach out to me. I'm happy to help coordinate. Um, and if we don't have any more questions, I guess we'll wrap up. Thank you, Dr. Parekh, for your uh, very interesting um, talk. Thank you, Tamara, for sharing your experience with us and for all the good questions tonight. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Appreciate the time. And I did forget to mention one more thing um, at the beginning that I did record. We did record this session, so we will send it out um, probably by the end of the week um, to anyone who logged on tonight or um, and or registered. So we will get that sent out. Everyone have a great night. Thanks, Dr. Parekh. Thanks, everybody.